So the title of our talk is Chef and Inspect Builds with Jenkins. And just to warn you a little bit, we're not going to go super in-depth on the inspect side, but we will be going in-depth on the build side. So all my clicker works. Yay. And the sort of subtitle of our talk also is making the right thing to do the easy thing to do. I know that Barry this morning was talking a lot about um, effortless infrastructure. Well, how do you get it to be effortless? It's not. And so, um, but I think that a way in which we can move in that direction is by making the right thing to do the easy thing to do because then things just work and then it starts becoming effortless. So... I am Annie Hedgepath, like uh, John was saying. Uh, you can catch me at Annie Hedgy at Twitter, on Twitter, and my website is AnnieHedgy.com, and I'm at 10th Magnitude, uh, Cloud Automation Engineer there. And I am Nick Huddison. Is it, can everybody hear me in the back? We're okay? All right. I'm Nick Huddison. Uh, I'm a Senior Systems Engineer for Relativity. Um, I've been doing Chef for, you know, a couple of years now. Uh, it's a lot of fun. What an exciting time to, you know, to, to live, you know, seeing all these awesome changes and hear about all these really cool things. <laughs> What's that? Oh, I heard moon pies. I don't know what that oh. is. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> those are coming back. Um, so, yeah, uh, Relativity, uh, if you don't know, uh, is a really big data platform. Um, we help uh, the e-discovery professionals or the, you know, the legal professionals navigate really complex uh, legal matters. Uh, we analyze documents, uh, and we look for what's called the smoking gun. Uh, and uh, we've had a lot of success. We manage a, you know, a lot of data, and we have a lot of you know, really big footprint in Azure. Uh, we're doing super, really exciting things, uh, and we are hiring. So, you know, <laughs> if you guys are looking, uh, come on over. Um, and then, Along you know, with everyone else here. That's right. <laughs> uh, and we want to tell a story uh, about, you know, really changing our perspective. Um, you know, we were trying to do this really cool thing, and we thought, you know, every step we were there, we were delivering awesome value, and then we had to like kind of, you know, be introverted and, and then look and say, yeah, maybe this wasn't that so good after all. And that's kind of the point of this. So, thanks for coming. Yeah, so Relativity has been a long-time client of 10th Magnitudes. As If y'all don't know 10th Magnitude, we're a Microsoft partner. We're a Azure consultancy. Um, and, and we are also a Chef partner. And so um, the trifecta here of Relativity, 10th Magnitude, and Chef, um, we've all worked together for a really long time. And here you can see a picture of Samir, who was just in this room the, the talk before, um, giving a, a talk, a Channel 9 live talk with um, Steve Murawski, and, and this was back when they were Kikira, not Relativity. Um, but they've been doing exciting things with Chef and Azure for a long time, and so whenever they told me that I was going to get to go on this, on this account, I was really excited because they just have a reputation of moving quickly, um, doing exciting things, pushing the envelope, all of that. And what they had come to realize was that um, sometimes when you move quickly, sometimes things um, break quickly also, um, or <laughs> they don't break soon enough. And so they brought me in because they know that I have a strong background in inspect and test kitchen and things like that. And so they, they wanted me to help with some test-driven development. Let's fail earlier so that our pipeline, pipelines are cleaner. And, um, and so that's what I was going to do. And so we needed to start super... Um, simply. So the very first thing we were going to do is test kitchen, right? Super basic, right? You just think, of course, that's the first thing you do is test kitchen. Well, some people weren't using it for their cookbooks. <gasps> that's the thing. Like, people don't use test kitchen. Who? I'm not going to make you raise your hand if you're not using test kitchen, but who uses test kitchen in here? Raise your hand. Very good. <laughs> Shame on you that aren't, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so anyway, but sometimes... Some cookbooks, it's really difficult to get it working. Some of them I had to kind of mock up some resources in Azure to get them to work. We were using the Kitchen Azure RM driver, and getting it to work on everybody's uh, workstation was somewhat of a challenge. And so it, there was that. There was education. There was workstations. There was um, uh, mocking up some stuff. So anyway, when we finally got Test Kitchen to work, it was really great. I was able to, uh, you know, really see if these cookbooks were doing what they were supposed to or not. So that was the first battle, was just Test Kitchen. Um, and I was on a small team. I only had about uh, six or so cookbooks. And that was sort of my proving ground, was to, to show them, like, how much value this could add. And then we could finally see, like, um, 
who who is breaking the dang cookbook, you know? Um, the thing was, however, that you you come to realize the next day whenever you you pull the latest changes that somebody else wasn't using Test Kitchen and went ahead and merged their changes. And so you still don't know who's breaking it. So I realize again, I'm still the easiest thing or the right thing to do still isn't the easiest thing to do. So let's let's take this further. That was just the first pass at things. But then you know that it's important, right? Like you know you need to create these practices where um, testing is made simpler, but the tyranny, tyranny of the urgent um, reigns. And so JIRA is calling, and the managers want to see tasks completed. They want to see stories done. They, um, the more the, the value that you're adding is how many tasks you can get completed, right? Um, we've all been there. It's not like unique to any, it's not unique to us, it's not unique to any of y'all, everybody does it. Um, and so the build continues to be read and, but hey, we are getting stuff done. We are checking off the task list, you know, um, with that disgustingly read page on Jenkins of, of broken builds. But stuff's getting done. So I knew that I needed to force people to use Test Kitchen, right? Like, they need to test their cookbooks because, um, number one, I'm tired of working on them if somebody else is going to break it. Like, I quit if somebody else is not going to test it themselves. And so uh, so I knew that, uh, that Jenkins running a build to report back to Bitbucket was my number one goal, right? I needed to force people. Um, but getting that to happen was a challenge. Not so much a technical challenge. It was a little of a technical challenge because I had to work some pieces out. But it was mostly a cultural challenge because of the tyranny of the urgent. There was so much on the backlog. And getting other things fixed was more important than spending the time that it took to get this to happen. And so, selfishly, I kind of started working on it on my own. And uh, the first pass at it was just creating a rake file. And so my rake file was going to make it to where um, eventually I knew that my end game was to have Jenkins file call the rake file. And so if you don't know what a rake file is, has anybody ever worked with rake files? Raise your hand. Okay. So a good handful of you. Um, it's just a, a build script that you can, that's a Ruby framework and you can uh, call different tasks. So first I was going to clean the cookbook. I was going to delete the burksfile.lock and delete the .kitchen folder so that I could start with a clean, fresh slate. I was going to run some linting, um, you know, food critic, rubocop, whatever you want, cook style. And then I was going to have it call test kitchen. And the way that it looks is super simple. You just call rake clean, rake style, rake, I think I just called it test or something. Um, and then the rake test kitchen will run through the entire thing. So uh, if you know, um, if y'all are familiar with test kitchen, you know that kitchen test will run through the whole thing. So it'll do the create, the converge. Like I think it'll do destroy first. Destroy, create, converge, verify, destroy. Um, and so then I was going to get the Jenkins file to call those exact. So you see right there, it's just calling rake clean, rake style, and then right there, rake test. And, um, and this is the end state of the Jenkins file, and so you can see that it's reporting back a success or a failure to Bitbucket, but we're not there yet. So that was really cool. Um, and then uh, Nick had already been working on some stuff like this, and so he told me about the multi-branch pipeline in Jenkins. Um, raise your hand if you use Jenkins in here. Who am I? Okay, great. Awesome. Wow. Um, well, I guess that's why you're here, right? <laughs> Duh. Um, but the multi-branch pipeline is cool because you can see all of your different branches. So it just calls a build. It uses your Jenkins file in your, in your repo, and then it builds each different branch so you can you know, test your feature branches. So that's pretty cool. So you can see in this demo cookbook repo, we've got master, a Nick revision branch, a test branch. So now we didn't have to ask if you ran Test Kitchen. You know, we can go back and just you know, kind of see because it was yes. you know, 
hey, did you run Tiz Kitchen? The build is broke. And they were always like, yeah, we totally ran it. Yeah, so so now I was like, hey, everybody, I did this thing. I made Jenkins file, and it's going to uh, it's gonna run Test Kitchen for you because I know you're not running it on your own machine. But, hey, I, I'm doing it for you now, you know? Um, but they – I actually just created one more thing for them to do. So instead of making the right thing to do, the easy thing to do, I actually added a step because I told them, okay, now go check Jenkins, you know, but number one, most of them didn't even have access to Jenkins. Um, number two, they're not going to go do it. They're just not going to. <laughs> I mean, because I just added another step. And so if, if it's something that they're not familiar with and if it's something that they don't fully understand, um, chances are you're just not going to do it. Um, but I was using it, so, like, I would look at somebody's PR, and um, I wanted to know if it passed Test Kitchen or not. And so I would go to Jenkins, and I would say, and I would, I would you know, if it was failing, I would, I would go back to the PR, and I would say, I would put the link to it, you know, trying to force them, you know, this is your broken build. And, um, you know, that worked sometimes. Sometimes it didn't. So I needed to make it even easier. The first puzzle piece, though, was the multi-branch pipeline. So just getting all of the branches to to build was, was the first step in the game. Um, the second step was using the Bitbucket uh, server webhook to Jenkins. So this would trigger Jenkins from Bitbucket. So, so once you did a push your, to your branch, whichever it was, then it would trigger Jenkins to, to run the, the multi-branch pipeline. So that was the, sec the second step, second puzzle piece. And the third puzzle piece was a little harder because we needed to tear down some silos. It, was, it wasn't harder. It was one line of code, or uh, about 10 lines of code, actually. But, um, but to find out how to get there, I needed to, like, actually talk to other teams. And so, um, so I was talking to Nick about it, and Nick was like, yeah, what we needed was the stash notifier. So we needed to have... Uh, Jenkins notify Bitbucket that the build passed or failed. And so, I mean, some of you probably, how many of you are already implementing this in your own? How many of y'all use the stash notifier and you, okay, so not that many people. That's, okay, good. Um, I mean, good because this is useful information for you. So, um, um, getting that piece figured out what just took some some trial and error and it took some troubleshooting and when you have the tyranny of the urgent with with your jira tasks you feel a little pressure and you're just like oh gosh i gotta get this done fast but how can i do it fast because you know um i don't know which user needs to be used i don't know who already installed the plugin and blah 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 so anyway the stash notifier needed the stash notifier plugin needed to be in Jenkins. We needed to have a user with credentials um, that uh, was able to have access from Jenkins, or yeah, that was in Jenkins that had access to Bitbucket. Is that how it worked? Yeah. yeah. Um, so to do that, I had to tear down some silos and actually go talk to other teams. So Nick was like, "Hey, I think Ray has been working on this, and so why don't you go ask Ray?" And so. In like an hour phone call or something, I think me and Ray figured it out. Or maybe we, we started it, and then he went off on his own and tried to figure out the rest of it. Um, and really all we needed was this this little block right here with the stash notifier. We needed that credentials ID. We needed to know which user it was going to be. Um, and then this piece right here was the the golden ticket. And what that allowed us to have was these beautiful, I wanted to like try to glorify this image because those little circles right there were really super meaningful to us because now we could see in Bitbucket, that's super small, but you could see here, this is your, your pull request, and you could see here there's a little green circle that says that, hey, your build passed in, in Jenkins. And so now Nick could make a pull request and put me on the review, and I could see immediately that it passed. And you can tell Bitbucket, don't even merge it if it fails. And that was the, the most glorious, beautiful thing. Um, and everybody should have that. Like, do that tomorrow. Like, go tonight, do it, because this is so wonderful if you don't already have it. Because... Let's fail as early as we can. Let's not get crappy code into our cookbook even and then wait until, you know, three after a three-hour build to find out that a bracket was missing or something, you know? Um, so that was really, really powerful. And people loved it. They were 
it just makes your work life more enjoyable when you don't have to deal with other people's mistakes or, um, or your own, you know, or whatever, when you don't have to, when the, um, mystery is taken away, you know, like, you know, for sure, whether it works or not. And it just makes it every, it takes my stress level down for sure. So this is a really dark slide and you can't see it very well, but these are all different little, um, um, Jenkins files. And my team was only working on just a few of them. And so my team was like the proving ground for this, this whole concept of if it was going to work or not. And like, we all know it's going to work, right? Like that's, of course, this is a great idea and we should be doing this. But, um, in order to justify the time spent on it, we needed to have a little proving ground. And so if you're, if you're dealing with, uh, the tyranny of the urgent and you want to prove to your, your managers and whatnot that it's a worthwhile um, venture, then, you know, having a, a small little POC is, is the way to go. So anyway, Nick was already trying to work on something like this. And then he saw what I did and he was like, wow, we should, we should totally use that logic and implement it in all of these or make all these different, um, changes to the cookbooks. And so he's going to talk about the challenge that it was to, um, uh, just expand it much further. And, I'll let him take it away with that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hearing you talk about it, um, you know, makes me really excited. Uh, it was an exciting time. Uh, it was a few weeks. We didn't work on the same team at the time, so it really was breaking down silos. Uh, and finding out, you know, what was going on, uh, it, you know, we sat, uh, well, virtually, but, I mean, we were really close, you know, co-located teams. Uh, and it was really interesting to find out she was working on something really, really similar. And, and that her code and Ray's code, by extension, uh, really helped the, the, the rest of us. Uh, and so getting back to making the, uh, the right thing to do, uh, the easy thing to do, uh, I, th I think, you know, you, you've done that with the, the pull request badges, right? You have this nice, you know, blue, green, and, and red badge. You don't have, the developers don't have to leave the screen. It's, you know, fantastic. Uh, I was tackling the situation from a little bit different of an angle. Uh, in order to get a cookbook uh, in, onto our, you know, platform um, for delivery, uh, required several manual steps. Um, those manual steps weren't really well documented, big shocker, uh, and you know, few people knew how to do it, uh, and even fewer people knew how it worked. Um, so what we saw a lot of times when we made changes to you know, our delivery workflow, um, or we brought on new cookbooks, uh, it, they went through what was called like the rough patch, uh, where uh, you know, the cookbook wouldn't get delivered to a certain environment uh, in a certain stage. Uh, and, the only way to really, you know, troubleshoot and fix that was per cookbook and per repo. And we'd have to go in and, you know, make the change to what we thought was right. Uh, and we weren't able to test it until, you know, the, the next time that merged. And sometimes that was a month and sometimes it was a couple weeks. Uh, and that was really, 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 really painful. So um, we rolled out what Annie did, okay, uh, you know, to all of our cookbooks because faster feedback. That was fantastic. Uh, and it worked for a while. Uh, and then we needed to change the workflow. And that was really, really, really painful. Uh, we had a pull request into all of our cookbooks to, I think it was like adding a chef server upload. Um, you know, 50 pull requests or however many cookbooks we, we did at the time. Uh, that was awful. So what we did was we looked into uh, what are called Jenkins uh, Global Libraries. Uh, anybody ever heard of them? Maybe? All right. Very cool. Um, so, and I saw the hands. So many Jenkins users here. Um, so Global Libraries allow you to define a step that's really native to Jenkins. Um, much like you use the batch step or the shell step or the test publisher step, uh, you can define your own step. Uh, and that's what exactly what we did. Um, uh, the global libraries are you know, really well documented. There's lots of examples out there. Um, and it, I, I think it's a pretty well supported you know, plugin. Um, very, very configurable. Uh, you could uh, load up you know, your, your global library. This is, how you, this is literally all you need to, to pull in your global library. Um, you can configure it at the server level, so every job in your server has access. Uh, you can configure it at the folder level, so uh, different folders can have different, you know, libraries or library versions. Um, and this is one of, you know, an example of a global library. And, and the takeaway here is, see that part in the middle? And that looks exactly like Annie's Jenkins file. I mean, it was almost the lift and shift. The, the part at the top is just copy and paste code, right? That is in every documentation example online today. If it looks scary, don't worry about it. You don't even have to touch it. Um, 
And the thing about it is that it's kind of like, uh, if you want to use chef terms, it's like a custom resource. Exactly. So what this is is like a custom resource build, and then we're just going to define it here and then call it somewhere else so that it's um, cleaner and you have it in one place. And this is what it does to our Jenkins files. So we took that big, long Jenkins file that was in 50 cookbook repos, uh, plus all the rake artifacts, uh, and we consolidated down to this, you know, three-line block. Uh, and I'm, I'm showing, you know, how flexible these are. Is you know, you can load these libraries at specific versions, branch names, tags, uh, right there in your Jenkins file, uh, which is really flexible. If you need to make a change to a global library, you know, you push up a branch on the global library, and then you come down to a consuming cookbook, and you just call that branch, and you can start testing it, you know, pretty interactively. Um, the global libraries allow for switches to be passed in, so in between the cookbook workflow block, uh, you could put like variable names, uh, you know, servers, like a server array of you know, what chef servers you wanted, and we really gave the power down to the engineers, um, which was really exciting. Uh oh. Oh, thank you for the hard to see. Oh, nice. <laughs> That's okay. That's cool. Um, Oh, and the other thing about that is that you could, he was talking about the switches, so um, it's, you can put like different parameters in there. So you could say, like right now, we've some of the cookbooks don't have a working test kitchen in them still, and so we could say, um, we have a parameter called strict, and so you could say strict, true, or false, and um, I think it's defaulted to true, but you could say strict, false, and then like it doesn't run, it doesn't fail the build if test kitchen fails. Um, and so you could do little things like that. So you still have a little bit of control in your your um, your build, but um, it's still defined in one place. Yep. Uh, and and a couple of you know pretty big wins uh, that we realized uh, from a system you know like this uh, is first you know we made the you know initial pull requests over you know all 50 of them to get them onto the global library, and then we didn't have to do it again uh, when we had new chef servers come up or down or we needed to do something else. Uh, we changed it in one place. We changed it in the global library, uh, and it affected all of our cookbooks. Uh, it also brought down the screen real estate. So if you saw you know, the example on the Jenkins files, our developers are doing other things in their Jenkins files. So instead of taking up you know, 200 lines for a cookbook build, we're taking up like four, uh, and they can do whatever else they want. Um, so that was really helpful, um, good feedback. Um, and then some more interesting things happen on a, on a global library you know, kind of model. Um, you know, Obviously, making changes is easy and central and, and all that, but uh, we had a, a new-to-chef team come online, uh, and we saw, uh, as the team you know, owning this code, um, we saw a pull request come through. Um, we're an all-Windows shop, most Windows, uh, and we run a lot of PowerShell. Uh, so this team had a couple really complex PowerShell scripts, uh, and as good engineers, as we all do, I know you guys all do it too, uh, they had pester tests. Um, to validate their logic, and they weren't breaking anything. Uh, so we saw a pull request to the global library that looked for pester tests, and when it found them, it executed them. We're like, wow, this is awesome. Um, so we uh, accepted right away. It didn't break anything. It worked for all of our cookbooks. If the tests were there, we assumed you wanted them run. Um, a very small change equated to a large you know, impact, uh, a good impact. Uh, from the same team, with maybe within like the same week, we saw another pull request that said, Hey, we're also gonna, you know, optionally because this would break, you know, every cookbook. We're gonna optionally, um, you know, run PS Script Analyzer if we find PowerShell scripts. Uh, but it's an opt-in, uh, and we accepted that because it didn't break any cookbook, you know, workflows. And again, you know, small change, big impact, you know, for the greater good. Uh, and we had a third team consume that new logic within days of it going in. So what we really are are creating an economy of, you know, adding a little bit of value for a very large scale of, of things, and it's. It's been a very fun and interesting experience. And you could see how that culture change. so the culture change snowballed. So that little green or red circle became addictive. People needed that now at pull requests. Like, if they didn't see one, they, they thought, well, how could I get this in, how could I create a build for this so that I could trust this pull, this pull request? And so... Um, with whatever good you want to bring about or whatever, however you want to make the right thing to do, the easy thing to do, um, that little investment of time that it takes to figure that out, to create that, that change, 
really pays off because of the snowball. And so I remember uh, I actually submitted a pull request that that broke a PowerShell script um, at some point in time. And I was like, and it broke a build, you know. And I was like, oh, man, I'm so sorry. I, I don't know what it was. Um, there was a pester test in there, and I didn't know about it, and I didn't run it, and I broke it. Um, and I was so apologetic. I was like, oh, I felt bad. You know, nobody wants to break the build. You feel so crappy after that. But Nick was like, hey, no big. We we can, like, that shouldn't have happened, you know? Like, now we can just, you know, not allow it to merge. And so the pester test was there. All he had to do was add that to that repo, and that's yep. it. It was fixed. And so now that is safe. Like, that, that whole repo is safe from breakage like that. Yep. And just little bit, you know, little wins every day will amount to a big thing. So instead of, you know, relying on engineers uh, who are, I don't want to say lazy, because that's the wrong word, but special, uh, instead of relying on them to, you know, copy a bunch of artifacts uh, across repos, uh, you know, rake files, Jenkins files, and make sure that they got the copy, you know, perfectly, uh, all they needed to do was copy that one little bitty block in there. Uh, and that's really how we, we scaled it from the, the first six, and it, was addicting. It really was. Uh, we actually have it in, across all repos, not just cookbook repos now, because it was very successful. Um, they only had to copy that little bitty, you know, block of line. Oops. Uh oh. Here, let me see. Automatic updates. Oh. Stupid Windows. So yeah, uh, you know, kind of kind of wrapping up and going along with you know, the theme, making the the easy thing to do uh, the right thing to do. Thank you. Uh, we want to call this out and make sure um, you know this is really important, especially in a, in a model that's kind of shared. Um, you can only program for eighty percent. You know, that other twenty, they they have to fend for themselves. And if you try to program for that twenty percent, you're going to fail, right? And it sucks, but you are, right? So. Program for 80%, and you'll deliver a lot of really impactful you know, business value. Uh, and the other 20%, well, they're not really in a different spot than they are today, but you made a big positive change to that 80%. So mm -hmm. make sure you stick to that rule. Um, so we all agree that some sort of system like this should be in place today, right? Some validation, some feedback system for your engineers. Um, but you might be wondering you know, which way to go. So we thought we would go over. We don't know. That's right. Uh, some of the pros and cons of both approaches, because there isn't, you know, a, a unicorn. They're, they both have some some good and bad. So uh, yeah, Annie, you want to lead us off? Um, yeah. So, oh. so there's definite pros and cons to either doing it the rake file way or the um, the global libraries way. And so here I'll take. Um, so first of all, if you're just going the rake file way, then um, it's super flexible. So you can do anything, and it's left up. It's left completely up to your repository owner. You can see that as a con also, but um, it's definitely super flexible. I had this crazy um, inspec build that I had to do because we were running inspec as a push job, and I had to like. It was a super complicated rake file, um, but I needed to be able to test it locally and tweak it, which, by the way, don't ever run in spec as a push job. Um, but anyway, but I had to create this rake file, and it was very, very flexible. I could do anything in it and get immediate feedback. Um, and it's local, so, you know, whenever you have to do complicated things, you can easily run it, tweak it, and test it locally. You have immediate feedback, and that's what you want when you're developing because it's so beautiful. And then you also have parity. Whatever you're running locally is exactly what gets run in Jenkins, and that is the best thing. You don't, I, I personally don't want um, to just guess at what the groovy script or the Jenkins file is going to build, you know, um, just, ho it's, I don't know, it's not my favorite thing. And so if I can um, do something locally first and then have it be exactly what gets run on Jenkins, then that is definitely preferable for me. So the cons, are there for sure some cons too. Um, updating it is requires a pull request to each repository and testing. And like he was saying, if you have 50 cookbooks that you're doing the exact same thing on, that's not ideal. 
downright demoralizing. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's, there's also no policy. So if you do have a standard policy that you want for all of your cookbooks, um, but each rake file is the one that's calling that prof- like that policy, then um, they could each be different. And so there's no standard. Um, or enforcement. Yeah, exactly. So there's no standard for how each cookbook was being tested since each rake file could be different. So it's just kind of the wild, wild west at that point. But if you only have like two or three or even less than 10, that might be more doable. Maintenance also, like it's just smaller scale. Like you, it's easier if there's only a few um, because somebody needs to support each repository as its own artifact. And you need to be um, kind of like build specialists, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, each of your repo. Like, our, a lot of our engineers, they don't really care about Chef, to be quite frank. Um, they are application developers. They care about front end and other things. Um, they didn't have to worry about that. Uh, so going a, a rake file model, you have to be you know, somewhat of a build expert um, to, to be able to maintain that properly. Um, and then, you know, the same thing for the global library approach, uh, some, some good and, and bad. Uh, and right away, uh, going along with the, the DevOps model, right, is we treat all of our cookbooks as cattle and, and not pets. Uh, and it's, it's a policy that you know, if you want to be on this platform, you know, great. We want to have you and we want you to add value every day. But if it doesn't work for you, sorry, you know, that's this, you're not in 80%, I guess. Um, and, you know, we don't have any pets. And, and that's been really, really helpful for us. Um, you know, kind of, this it was an easy one, right? You make quick changes, really fast changes. You know, server goes down, you need to, you know, update a URL, do it in one place, get it approved, it affects immediately. Um, uh, and then they're just downright gorgeous, right? You, in the Jenkins files, it's a couple lines of code, uh, and you just don't have to worry about it. It's like a subscribe service. We'll do it for you. Um, but there's some big, 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 down, downfalls from this, uh, and that this is actual feedback that we got from our platform, uh, and I thought it was valuable, uh, that it is a magic voodoo box and nobody understands what's going on under the hood. I <laughs> thought that was the service we were providing, um, <laughs> but I guess not. Uh, so a con, uh, you know, just kind of, you have to just kind of trust the people that are running this code that they know what they're doing, um, and you don't really get a say. You know, you can add to it, but you got to go someplace else and do a separate repo to like find, you know, the definition, and it's kind of annoying. Um, it's not local. This is a huge one for us. Uh, this is actually going to, uh, it's already started to um, cause us to rethink our strategy a little bit. Um, you can't run it locally, right? There's no rake, like rake test. That is super handy. And, and you need to give your engineers kind of like the ability to do this stuff locally so they don't bog your servers down, you know? Um, and that was the third point is the push and pray, right? Um, People are disincentivized to actually write the test and ensure that you know the code fix, you know, fixes the test uh, all before the commit and push. Uh, what we see is uh, a bunch of testing commits, and I can't tell you how much I hate that. <laughs> um, but yeah. So I hope that gives you a pretty good idea of. Um, kind of where we've landed on things is kind of like now we see the pros and cons of both and we're just going to grow from there. So we're going to keep the snowball going and um, keep refactoring this to, you know, make better green builds. Um, So at this point, we'll take some questions and or do a demo. So yes, yours. All right. Well, I think that's all the time that we have left, but thank you all so much for for being here and y'all can catch us on Twitter. Thank you.